33 million pounds to build. She'd cost today about 200 million pounds. The um, p and company are building a new one in Finland, uh, which is about half this size, and that's costing 80 million pounds. See, I've always been baffled that you, you've, you've bought legends, really. You've gone into newspapers, you bought the Ritz, you bought the QE2. Good names, yes. All good names. We couldn't names. have built the QE2. It was much more sensible to buy Cunard. So if you'd, if you'd known in 71 what you know now, you'd certainly have gone through the whole exercise again. Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be... A, there is no other company like Cunard. That we, if, we had, if we hadn't got it, it would either have gone bust or somebody else would have bought it. It was in too much trouble in an executive sense to sort itself out. It had to be sorted out by a new owner. And uh, it was a unique opportunity, which we, we took. Now, a, a place like this, for example, which is the ultimate in, in luxury, it would seem to be an anomaly in, in today's travel because we're, we've, travel has been Lakerized, really, has it not? And... The luxury and the size of the ship is what sells her, plus the speed. Uh, we can do 28 knots if we need to, <clears throat> with no difficulty at all. Other cruise ships are... 18 to 22. Now that's one point. So 12 weeks in this suite, for example, would cost us what? 180,000 pounds, something of that sort. 180,000 pounds? Yes. I can remember on the first world cruise of the Kui in 75 that, the, that the, the media whipped up a lot of antipathy towards the ship. They were talking about the idle rich travelling on board, escaping from austerity and a flagrant a waste of money and that sort of thing. The fact that many of the passengers were publicans and small shopkeepers and, and, and London transport bus inspectors <laughs> didn't uh, really get through. But nevertheless, there was a lot of hostility really towards the Kui I think that was a relic of a sort of ill-natured Britain that now is behind us. It was completely misplaced at that time to make that sort of remark, but it was made. The fact was that we were in yet another foreign currency and balance of exchange crisis. <clears throat> and to have a ship earning 85% of her revenues from foreigners was a very important source of foreign exchange. I think Britain has changed. I would be ashamed of myself to have been associated with that kind of criticism in the mid-70s. And I don't think, I don't think you'd get it now. We certainly don't get it, but I think the British public generally has woken up to the realities and doesn't mind at all. It applauds this kind of enterprise. How much does it cost to keep her afloat now? I suppose... Um, Total costs this year about £45 million. Pounds. Total revenue is about 50. So there's a margin of 5, 10%, which is really extremely good. The problem has been oil prices, much more than labour costs. I mean, it costs more to fuel this boat than it does to pay the entire crew, <laughs> plus the people who are on leave at present. But our revenue is a million dollars, and... Uh, at present, we're, we're definitely on the right side. Because your, your crew costs are in sterling, of course. A That's lot of right, and our income's in dollars. Which is a, a happy position. It's quite a, good, uh, quite a good posture, yes. So you're, look at, you're even looking at the QE2, really, uh, through, through the balance sheet. You have to. That doesn't preclude an emotional involvement, but if you can't get the figures right, you better leave it alone. And the QE2 figures are right now? Oh, yes. So now what about the future? Well, a very happy future for 12 years as a minimum, and it could be 25. The only thing that will put this ship out of business will be technical obsolescence if new techniques come along that are far less fuel intensive and things like that. But I don't see the slightest prospect of that happening. I'm very optimistic indeed about this ship. The arrival of new passengers is celebrated, of course, by yet another captain's party. Very glad to meet you, sir. Mr. and Mrs. Go. That's right. Mr. and Mrs. Yao. Mrs. Fulcher. 
And this was called. On this leg of the cruise, many passengers are Japanese with names that can complicate a steward's life. Mr. Tchaikovsky. They're not much used to shaking hands and certainly not practiced at receiving this regal, stiff-armed welcome, but they handle it in their various ways. And Mrs. Boyd, Mr. and Mrs. Kosaka. But in the end, it's the really foreign names that get you. Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Next day, every one of their big moments is up for sale, and in every photo, the captain's strong right arm. Having seen how they look on camera, passengers try to restore their image in time for their coming invasion of China. Okay. middle of the aerobics class, that little Japanese lady in black in the second row is certainly determined, yet somehow seems to go her own way. Such sturdy independence probably means that, subconsciously, she just doesn't appreciate the theme from the River Kwai. Just toe front. You see those fingers? The surrender is unconditioned. Still sunburnt and warm from the tropics, the QE2 ploughs through the Yellow Sea, where a British company is about to start drilling for oil. And after the weather we've known down on the equator, this forlorn scene does seem uncomfortably like the North Sea. But within this spaceship, the life to which a couple of thousand people have grown accustomed continues cosily, warmed and controlled by watchful guardians, quite independent of that distant world to which we once all belonged, which can now only intrude by radio. And you want to speak to Mr. or Mrs. Yap in Hong Kong? Sorry, no, I'm sorry. Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Hong Kong. This is QE2, 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 down on uh, channel 811, 8749 decimal 9. You seem to be a bit better here. Can you give me a few words for tuning, please? The QE2 has an officer's dining room, canteens for petty officers and crew, and four passenger restaurants. Yet the food here is said to be the best on board. In the bowels of the ship, her own permanent Chinese ghetto was struck a cruel blow in mid-Pacific when their New Year's Day disappeared without trace, lost when the QE2 thoughtlessly crossed the international date line on that significant day. They were inscrutable, of course, and just carried on washing rather noisily. The crew get their laundry done free, their passengers must pay 70 pence for every handkerchief that passes this way. How many hours do your chaps work a day? 14 hours. 14? 14. For how long? Is that? Every day. Well, for the whole cruise? For the whole cruise, sometimes in less. And then how many months do you take off after that? No, we don't take off. Usually we work for a year, then we take off for maybe about two or three months. Then you go back to Singapore? Right? We go back to Singapore, yeah. Aha. I get the feeling you haven't got a union down here. No, we've got no union. <laughs> so 
so downstairs it's always full steam ahead as they press on, tending to the transmogrification of the fortunate 1100 upstairs. <laughs> Up here, passengers can be cajoled into making much of their own entertainment. As I said, there's nothing like a cruise for changing your attitude and outlook. And just as soldier well ran up our parade to see the game. Hong Kong, now below the horizon, may stand for the rights of the individual. But we're about to arrive in communist China, which stands for the rights of the community. Then again, Hong Kong's a welcoming city, but China's always held off foreigners, so who knows what to expect? Many jewelers, the gold and silver, and jade, and antiquities. Cruiser's worries about tomorrow's adventure into an alien world are calmed by the arrival on board of officials from the China Travel Service. Yes, Do we need a converter in the hotel in Peking in order to use hair dryers, shavers, whatever? Two, uh, 220. It's 220 volts in the hotels. They hand out the good news and the bad news. No credit cards acceptable, they say, but there's no tipping. No 16 millimeter films to be shot, though eight millimeters acceptable, and so are photographs. Would it be possible to get to the rock factory, the bar directly? They're having a giant ponder on that one. So the QE2 reaches Communist China. This wall is built in now. New wall. New wall, yes. Just yes. built in. Yes. Yeah. Just be built. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, it's not on our job. Thank you. Thank you. Qingdao, between Shanghai and Beijing, is one of China's biggest ports, yet little known to the world outside. Slowstone port. Slowstone port. Midship. Midships. Its ice-free harbour is navigable all year round for 10,000 tonne vessels, but the QE2 is seven times bigger. So they've had to build that wharf the pilot was telling the captain about. Starboard engine stopped. Having steered through the narrow harbour entrance, the pilot must now turn the QE2 through 90 degrees, while across the bow there's a tricky three-knot current. Half a stern port. Half a stern port. The QE2 observes some aging Chinese submarines and is in turn observed by Chinese television. Here, not to entertain its few viewers, but to make an instructional tape showing how the port coped with her biggest visitor and all who sail in her. The pilots also brought a number of colleagues to watch and to learn. On that new wharf, the first coaches arrive. They're joined by the first of 500 welcoming schoolchildren. Stop engines! The staff captain of the QE2, Keith Stanley, comes ashore. Waiting for him, the men from Peking. Their bureaucracy is a ponderous thing and stunningly slow, but in months of preparation, Cunard's got it across that their wealthy cargo has only a few hours to see and be seen, to change dollars, go on tours, buy souvenirs, and be back aboard by the stroke of ten. And it seems that after two decades of isolation and...